With a whole universe of things to learn, it's important to start with the essentials. Let's go over the concepts that make Kubernetes usable, scalable, and just downright awesome. Are you ready? Hello, I'm Kazan Fields. I'm a developer advocate at Google Cloud, where I focus on Kubernetes and Google Kubernetes Engine. Today, we're going to be demonstrating what it's like to get hands-on with some Kubernetes essentials. And to guide us, we have an expert, Anthony Bouchon. Anthony, would you introduce yourself? Yeah, happy to. Thanks for having me here, Kazan. My name is Anthony Bouchon. I'm a specialist customer engineer at Google, uh, focused on working with users uh, who are trying to run Kubernetes uh, on GKE in production. Wow. So you must have some really cool insights into how this stuff works in the real world. So I'm really excited to see what you're going to teach us today. <laughs> Definitely just trying to build on the concepts that you and Carter have introduced uh, in previous episodes of Kubernetes Essentials. Specifically, we're going to take a look at how you can uh, work with namespaces and services when something is going wrong with the deployment of your application in Kubernetes. They each have respective properties that we can take a look at to help us debug and help us remediate whatever issue we're resolving or we're running into in our Kubernetes environment. Cool. So what are we going to start out with? Well, uh, for starters, we're going to have a sample application running in a Kubernetes cluster. And that sample application is comprised of a front end pod uh, which is fronted by a service type load balancer. So we have a public IP address, so we can access it in a browser. And that front end pod is communicating with a back end pod. And so the back end pod is returning a whole bunch of information uh, and metadata about the environment in which it's running. And we can actually see here these specific requests that the front end is issuing to the back end. If we take a look at the Kubernetes manifest, we'll see here that uh, they are both re represented by deployments, um, and they each reside within their own specific namespaces. So in this specific scenario, we have the front end that is managed by team A running in namespace team A. And then we have uh, the back end application, which is owned by team B running in namespace team B. Cool. So here we have a website which has a front end and a back end. And those, the, the front end and the back end are each owned by separate teams. And those teams are utilizing different namespaces. So what are we going to look into next? Well, uh, we're going to take a look at uh, uh, the namespaces a bit further so that, so that we can understand what constraints could actually be defined at the namespace level that might actually affect the deployment of our pods and applications. So as you can see, namespaces are a great way to divide the resources within a given cluster across various teams. And namespaces give you a lot of control between what you can actually um, access uh, within a given cluster uh, uh, so as you can see here that we have uh, the front end is owned by team A, and we have a namespace called team A. And then we have uh, the back end, which is owned by team B, and it's in the namespace team B. Cool. So let's take a deeper look at these namespaces. So when digging into the namespaces within a given cluster, it can often be a bit difficult to navigate uh, and understand which namespace you're working against. So the KubeNS tool is a great tool to show all the namespaces in your cluster, as well as which one you're Kubernetes context is currently configured to interact with. Once we know what namespace we're working with, team B in this case, we can run commands like kubectl auth can I and define the verbs and resources that we want to interact with. So if we want to delete or create, uh, let's say, pods, we want to be able to check and ensure that we can actually interact with these resources in that given namespace. And so once that we have verified that we have permissions to the namespace to interact with the resources we need to, we can actually describe the namespace and take a look at some of the constraints that are defined at a namespace level. The first one is resource quotas. So uh, if it's a great way to limit the resources that a team can use within a given Kubernetes cluster. So in this case, we're defining a pod resource quota. Um, and it's a great use case for trying to preserve IP allocation across multiple teams sharing the same Kubernetes cluster. So in this case, uh, we're ensuring that this team can only run five pods, which means five IPs that it will consume. We also want to define resource limits. Basically, these are just uh, range uh, limit ranges that define uh, our minimum and maximum amount of CPU that containers can request uh, when running in this namespace. And so it's a great place to troubleshoot because either these could be reasons why your deployment fails or why your deployment is being blocked because there are constraints in place uh, within that given namespace. So namespaces give us a way to uh, manage and isolate resources on some basis, in this case, on a team basis. And there are also controls in there that we can use to make sure that uh, all of the resources for that team are running the way that we expect them to. 
Exactly, exactly, right? Like limit ranges, resource quotas, these are all things that could be defined for various teams. Role-based access control is a really good way to not just uh, isolate uh, individual user access to various resources, but also service accounts that workloads use if they require different levels of access uh, within the cluster as well. And uh, this is just the tip of the iceberg. There's also, uh, there are many things that are namespace scope, network policies, for example, that can be, again, uh, different constraints that are defined for where your workloads run. Cool. So what are we going to dive into next? So we took a little bit about what we can uh, do to understand how namespaces may be affecting our interactions with Kubernetes. So the next thing that we're going to take a look at are Kubernetes services and how we can interact with them to understand what may be going wrong with our application running in a Kubernetes cluster. Cool. So let's take a deeper look at them. Happy to. So uh, <laughs> if we take a look at the front end that we deployed, we can actually see the uh, host that the front end or the host name that the front end is actually issuing a request against, which is the backend service that is owned by Team B. And so uh, Kubernetes services, as you've talked about in the past, uh, Kaslin, uh, are a nice abstraction um, on top of uh, Kubernetes pods or replicas of a given pod. And so rather than trying to think about a per pod level, we can think about a service level that maps to numerous replicas of a pod. And it's represented by the objects you see here, pods, services, and endpoints. And so when we want to troubleshoot something locally, we can actually port forward against the service where we actually are, again, port forwarding uh, interactions uh, with our backend to our local uh, 8080 port. So as you can see, I'm going to issue a command to localhost on port 8080. And we're actually going to get a response directly from our backend that is running in the Team B namespace. So basically, when you're going through the debugging uh, cycle, if you need to interact with services locally or things that are a little harder uh, to visualize uh, with like a web UI or something like that, you can actually port forward it to your development workstation and begin to interact with it on your local host. So services give us a way to interact with workloads running on Kubernetes. We can run our apps in pods, uh, but if you have multiple copies of those pods, then how do you interact with the the workload as a whole. And services give us that. Exactly. And you get a DNS record that gets provisioned. Uh, so again, you don't even have to remember that uh, virtual IP or that cluster IP address. You can actually natively interact with it uh, with a DNS host name that gets, or a DNS record that gets provisioned to Kube DNS or your cluster's DNS. And so it's really useful for, uh, again, clients within the cluster to interact with your application. But it's, again, also useful for end users trying to understand what's going on. Uh, with the port forward command uh, with kubectl. Nice. So where do we go from here? Well, I, <laughs> we showed a little bit about DNS. So you know, there's the age-old joke about how it's, <laughs> it's always DNS. So I think it's important to understand a bit more about how we can interact and troubleshoot uh, with the DNS in our Kubernetes cluster. All right. So let's take a look at it. What have you got to show us when we're debugging DNS? So I think the first thing uh, that's important to uh, capture and understand is where uh, kubedns is actually running within our cluster. So uh, we're going to run kubedns again, and we're actually going to see a namespace called kube system. And so kube system is where system pods that are required for the cluster to function, like DNS, uh, typically reside. So if we actually run kubectl get pods uh, and grep for kubedns, we're going to see a few pods running, two replicas of kubedns, as well as an autoscaler. So I think it's really important to understand, you know, as your cluster scales up. As your workloads scale up, uh, <laughs> the number of DNS uh, queries uh, also typically goes up. And so typically, you want to make sure that your kubedns uh, pods are actually scaling up uh, properly and are able to handle all of the uh, various um, uh, volume of DNS queries uh, coming from your services. And so when something is going wrong, if you take a look at this, we've navigated to a, a YAML file for a DNS utils container. And this is actually giving us a way to interact with uh, kubedns without having to package up uh, tools that we would use to troubleshoot into our application containers. So once we actually apply the DNS utils uh, YAML file, you'll see that this single pod of uh, called DNS utils has been created. And then we're going to um, take again, just verify what namespace it's in. And so we're going to switch to cluster utils. Uh, again, a great way to separate uh, uh, tooling we use to troubleshoot from application workloads. Then we're going to run the kubectl exec command. And we're actually going to pass in a couple flags, dash i and dash t. And this is basically a way for us to kick off an interactive shell within the DNS utils pod. 
And the DNS utils pod will have tooling that we may want to use to troubleshoot DNS, like NS lookup. And so um, it's also important to know that while you could you know, uh, get the interactive shell by passing dash i and dash t, you can also just uh, execute the single command uh, if that's as uh, you know um, if that's what the use case calls for and not an interactive shell. So what we're doing here is we're actually testing the DNS resolution for our backend service. So we're using gceme backendteam uh, team b, and we'll see that we actually got the cluster IP returned to us properly. And so once we actually run kubectl get service. Uh, we'll actually see that this is um, the same cluster IP that was returned from the DNS resolution. Cool. So what you did here is really interesting. You uh, created a new pod within Kubernetes that had these DNS utils on it, and then you used that pod to debug what was going on with DNS in the cluster. That's really interesting and gives you a really nice way to debug what's happening with DNS without even messing with your other existing applications in the cluster. Yeah, exactly, right? Like I think it's it gives you a safe way to package up a set of tools that you only need to use for a specific period of time. And then you can spin it down once you're done um, troubleshooting or you've uh, identified the root cause. And I think this really helps uh, minimize what we actually need to bake into our application containers. And that's useful for a whole bunch of reasons, whether it's security, whether it's performance, there are different a bunch of different angles and benefits that we get from making sure that we're not uh, basically causing bloat within our application containers. So, what else do we want to go over today? Well, I think it was really uh, you know cool to see the exec um, uh, functionality within kubectl for our our sort of toolbox or DNS utils container. But I also want to show that this is something that you could do with your application containers as well. So we'll take a little bit uh, further look as to when we would uh, run an exec into our application containers. So kubectl exec, great for utilizing with utility or debugging containers, but also can be used uh, with your application containers as well. Uh, this is useful if you need to take a uh, if you need to take a look at the environment in which your application is running. So if something's going wrong with your application as it's running in Kubernetes, we can use this tool to dive into them and figure out what's happening. Exactly. So just building upon the example uh, that uh, we have in this uh, in this in this video today here, uh, we're going to take a look at uh, we're going to switch back to the team B namespace, and we're actually going to take a look at our backend container or our pod here that's running serving our backend, and we're actually going to run the same kubectl exec command. Uh, and we're going to uh, provide the pod name. So in this case, um, the backend production pod with a specific uh, uh, hash at the end. And then we're going to kick off an interactive shell once again. And so this is a way for us to understand what's going on in our actual runtime environment. So I just ran print env, and I can actually see all the different environment variables that are configured within this environment, this container. And so it's really useful if um, you need to take a peek at things that might change or want to verify that things are correct within the actual container that you're running. And another thing that's interesting about this is that going back to, you know, again, the conversation of uh, creating minimal containers, sometimes you actually won't even have a, uh, a running shell or something that you could um, initiate a connection to. And so uh, in those scenarios, uh, kubectl has actually added functionality for mounting a debugging container um, into that running pod. Right. So if you don't have a running shell, there's actually a relatively new functionality that enables you to still get that interactive environment where you can do things like check environment variables or other things that might affect your application um, while you're troubleshooting. Thanks for that demo, Anthony. You covered a lot of really cool stuff in there and a lot of tips and tricks that even I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I really think we're just scratching the tip of the iceberg here, right? I think I just really wanted to take a look at namespaces and services and some of the essentials that are important that you know folks interacting with Kubernetes should be aware of uh, when trying to figure out when things are going wrong, why they are going wrong, and you know trying to remediate them. But of course, there's so much more to, to dive into, right? Today, we learned about how Kubernetes namespaces can help you isolate and manage resources, for example, on a per team basis. And we learned how services can help you reach your workloads and can help you debug them. Then we learned some great tips and tricks for debugging both networking problems from kubedns and how to get into your applications to debug them using kubexec. Thank you so much for watching. If you want to explore more, we'll have links to additional resources in the description below. And be sure to like and subscribe for more content from Google Cloud. We'll see you next time.